Ariel, Rasiali, and um Sheun. Okay. Um, who would be um supporting the call today? And then um, if you need anything, you can um talk to any one of us. Um, so Rasiali has already I think started the recording. So which is wonderful. I'm just going to um remind everyone that we do have a code of conduct, which if you look at the from a part at line 17 um so if you experience any unacceptable behavior uh please um contact the organizers through teams at we are .org or report to individual uh, organizer at uh, baronese uh, malvika you or myself all at um we are .org. and also to remind you that this call is being recorded so if you do not want your video to appear i will kindly ask you to um close your video turn it off and then once the call is over we are going to have the recording please on youtube so that those that were unable to join us today can have um can take at some time to watch the video <clears throat> as you join in please um kindly um write your name we have an icebreaker question there name and then outside your work slash study context where have you felt most included involved or welcome so different um individuals have different places that they feel most welcoming and it's kind of the theme of what we are discussing today in terms of community management so how do you make your community more inclusive how do you make sure that you understand the different members of your community and how do you create different content for the different members of your community So with that, I will hand over to Gracieli, who would kick us off with the, the presentation to find where we are. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Dash. Um, so welcome, everyone. I'm curious to see your answers to the icebreaker question, because it's always good to know where people feel welcome. And today is all about making people feel welcome and to talk about community management, interactions, and how to keep your open project engaging and respectful. Um, so today we're going to be in our community management cafe one. Um, oops. Yeah, we are on the week eight of our Open Seeds program. We are going to have another community management cafe on week 13. So there are a lot of uh, interactions between those two calls and some questions that you might have today might be answered then in the week 13. Um, and the learning objectives for today, at the end of the session, you'll be able to consider different kinds of interactions for your community. Use the mountain of engagement method to support participants through various levels of engagement. Develop persona and pathways for your community to for taking people's experiences and expectations in planning your projects. Um, we are going to have some guest speakers today who are experts on these things. <laughs> so do you have any questions or comments so far? Feel free to mute or leave a question in the chat. No? Okay. If nobody has any questions, I'll pass the torch to Chris to talk about community interactions. Thanks, Garcia. Um, so it's very nice the, to have been invited to all of us again. Uh, I think I was here last year, maybe the year before, and I remember it's such an engaged bunch. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here and talk to you a bit uh, about community interactions. But first, a bit about me. Who am I? Um, so hi, I'm Chris Heikrink, uh, pronouns they, them. Uh, I live in Berlin, but I'm originally Dutch, and um, I've been doing open science for over a decade. And um, by now I don't really, well, I just did, but I don't call it open science as much anymore. And it's so much more around um, building community and, and, and really creating spaces for people to um, 
to create a better world, so to say. So big, lofty, uh, lofty ideas uh, always very much excite me. But ultimately, the community interactions are what create them. Uh, and so one of my things, one of the philosophies I uphold is that, um, you know, any single person can have an idea and that can be a departure point, but it's the group of people who you collect around that idea who uh, who really create what that becomes. And so uh, today I wanted to start with, um, with a, an idea that is called the thought collective. And it's a very interesting thing that I like to think about when I am designing or thinking about a community space. And that is that if it's a space where it's just me, I'm interacting with my own thoughts and the end result is a function of that. But if, for example, uh, I invite Graciel to, uh, to into a, a virtual or a physical space and I say, hey, let's you know think about this or let's uh, work on something together. That's a completely different interaction and different results come from that. And then if you add another person and another person, Every time this composition of the group of the community changes, the whole um, the whole function uh, changes, and so the outcomes also change. And that really thoroughly for me embodies this idea of it really, really matters who you in involve in uh, in the process uh, because literally what comes out is shaped by that. And so each composition, provides unique outcomes. And um, so to just pause with that, I think too often we sort of just send out mass emails or just invite who, whomever uh, because we want people to attend. And I think here this idea of thought collectors is a really great way to pause and say, well, who is it really that you want to not just contribute, but want to really deeply influence what is happening and that that is something that i very much enjoy because it so frequently is just about mass gatherings uh these days but a community is a, much more about also creating that cohesion and showcasing that people are uh, in a space where they can meaningfully contribute and this idea i've noticed also in working in teams is incredibly helpful to also make people feel seen, feel like they're actually contributing, even if it's part of a big group. And so one of the things that I wanted to highlight here is that you can gather people, a different group of people around a topic that you want to work on, and it will affect how, how the outcome um, is created. But there's this, uh, this great model uh, from a community management organization, CSCCE, uh, which maybe some of you have uh, participated in uh, or, or heard about, and they, they really separate this participation model, the interactions within a, in a community into different forms. Uh, and so I realized I could have put this on a slide. I didn't take the time to prepare slides because I figured it would be very nice to just engage in a conversation with you, uh, but I'll, I'll drop the link in the, in the chat so you can also view it for yourself, but they really, so, compartmentalize different kinds of interactions in a community into conveying and consuming, where it's literally one or a few people conveying something outward and vice versa. Um, the, the consumers uh, in the community, they just consume what is being uh, sent out. Now, that's a kind of interaction that can be very effective, that can be very relevant to your work if you uh, not trying to collaborate with people, but you're really trying to spread information widely. This is a very effective way, but if you want to create something that that might not be um, the best fit. Then the other uh, form is to collaborate. Um, that really means that people come together, they start interacting more. So the, the outcome is really being uh, affected by it, uh, but there is still a certain or hierarchy, and that's not necessarily negative. It's you contribute to something, but there's a, a more central place um, where the decision making uh, happens. 
And then there's uh, co-creation where really the outcomes get shaped in a deeply deep manner by everyone who is attending. So there's a, a mix of, uh, of input. And uh, as a result of that, that is what happens. There is no predetermined outcome, um, more so that there is a predetermined process on. And so that's a great model to think about if you're designing spaces. So combined, thinking about what is the mode of interacting and who is doing the interacting. Those are two very critical pieces um, to designing community spaces. And really taking the time to, to think about this is very helpful. And so um, uh, just to, to give you some uh, example uh, is that, uh, no, wait, I'm going to give the example a bit later. I'm jumping ahead a bit. Uh, but so you can think about who is in the room, be very mindful about who you're inviting, uh, be mindful about how you're structuring the meeting. And then there's a few other things that you can do. Um, so as I said, providing structure is very important. Sometimes it feels like providing a lot of flexibility to a community is very helpful uh, because people you want to give people agency to decide what they want to do. Uh, but sometimes that also creates so much ambiguity that people don't really know how they how they can be of value, um, what is expected of them. And so in if you're creating a community space, it's perfectly okay to to provide structure. It can be very you know very liberating for people to sit back and enjoy. Um, it's it's very helpful, for example, here also in OLS that it's so mindfully set up to uh, have the pad, to have the structure. People know what to expect. Um, it helps them to, to participate in a meaningful manner. The timeline of the meeting is very helpful for the speakers who come in uh, and, and go again. So really providing structure is very, very helpful uh, to provide good interactions uh, because people know what to expect. And indeed, as Gracia mentions in the chat, providing structure is fundamental to providing flexibility in other levels. And so I'm gonna tag into that a bit uh, because there's one form of structure that we, I know I very quickly tend to tended to avoid, but not so much anymore. Um, and that's thinking about what do I want to get from, from this session or from this gathering. And so uh, one of the facilitators who's mentored me over the years has given me this great, uh, great tip and says, they, they call it constructive selfishness. It's to say, what do you want to get out of this? You, you don't need to even tell others, but to articulate that for yourself so you can clearly say, okay, this is why I'm doing it, to find that purpose. And then to also be able to keep people on topic, um, to be able to say, hey, if you can articulate what it is that you're trying to get from, from, from this session and to say, well, this is how you can meaningfully contribute to what I'm doing, uh, to what we are trying to achieve. And so you can really be uh, you know, selfishness on its own, I don't think is the best idea, but constructively selfish is saying, I'm trying to help us achieve X, then people can meaningfully contribute towards that. And uh, so uh, in terms of community interactions, that's, that's not, paradoxically enough, it's very good to focus on what you're trying to get out of it. Uh, and then another thing is that um, when you are designing such a such a space is to think about how much do you try to achieve. Um, it's very easy for us to think about, oh, we get all these people in one place, so we need to really make use of them gathering. So I want to cover uh, uh, one topic, another discussion that you wanted to do, um, a third question, a fourth, and a fifth. But uh, that means it gets very overloaded. People have very little breathe, breathing space to actually interact. And so what's very, uh, very common is to, uh, or a recommendation I would give, is to think about what is it that you want to achieve? Write those things down. And then by default, pretty much cut it in half. Try to prioritize uh, because the we often try to, or at least that's my experience, we often try to do too much in one go. 
And so if you have a 45 minute slot that your community is gathering, uh, if you're trying to do two things, it's probably already a lot, especially if you're trying to have a discussion. And so really think about how do you provide the space for the interactions to really happen, not just that you're checking boxes that you've done things, but to really meaningfully have these interactions. And you know, uh, worst case scenario, the discussion is quickly done and you can fall back onto uh, what you had before. And then finally, one thing that uh, I've also noticed is that it's also very important to be mindful of who is um, who is facilitating uh, when the community actually gathers. It's it's a role. It shouldn't always be the same person, uh, or at least ideally, um, so that different people can uh, participate in different sessions as well. So in different ways. So for example, say if Graciel is hosting the meeting every single week or every single two weeks, then Graciel cannot participate as much. So it would be great if there's a one week uh, every now and then where somebody else does some of the hosting so that um, there's, a, there's a bit of uh, liberating and you can shift into a different role. So thinking about uh, what roles, who is doing it um, is very helpful across multiple sessions. Uh, but also then within one session, it's very important to think about, well, how much is somebody participating? So how little is someone participating? So if you know that you tend to not interact as much um, by voice, maybe it's a great way to put stuff in, in chat if, if that's possible in that moment. If you know you're very vo verbal, maybe to then you know take a step back and say, okay, uh, I'm gonna put it in the chat and let somebody else speak for a moment. Um, so a great rule here is to think about how many people are in the room and talk only one nth of the time. So five people in the room, you try to talk around 20% of the time. Doesn't always work if there's somebody doing a presentation, of course, like right now, there's more people in the room. Uh, so that is something that is, uh, of course, also to take into account. And so, yeah, with community interactions, there's a lot to think about, but it also provides a lot of opportunity to really shape a space where people can um, have this space to have meaningful interactions, to create something they can't on their own, uh, whether that's new ideas, new connections, uh, or new projects or new outcomes. And so I'm also mindful of the time I'm getting today. Um, so I'm, I'm going to shut up here and... Uh, I'm happy to take any questions uh, in the chat uh, or if there's time also here. Thank you, Chris. I was taking notes, <laughs> finishing taking notes. Um, yeah, so if anyone has questions, feel free to unmute yourself or to uh, write a question in the chat or even in the frame of ed, we have a space there for questions. Um, I will start talking if you don't talk. <laughs> so, that was really interesting, Chris. Um, I really like the every point that you mentioned here, like the constructed self selfishness. And thank you, Aria, for taking notes about those things. <laughs> You're great at taking notes. <laughs> Um, and the thing of providing structure, I was just finishing a note here on how an example of how we provide structure here in this call and flexibility for people to go into breakout rooms, speaking or writing the language of the preference, but this is done under a structure that we thought about beforehand. Um, yeah, so if people have questions, um, have you thought about the structure for your community already in your project? No. Okay. Hello. Is that question? A question? Yeah. It's me, okay. Alfredo from Argentina. Thank you, Chris, for for the presentation and for the, the words. I I was thinking in in this point that it is very important to let people uh, expect what the interaction should accomplish, or uh, at least uh, in order to make the interaction in between inside the community to be to be useful uh, we should be very clear in how what to expect 
So when you're like brainstorming or generating new ideas, how 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 do you think it is possible to define or to more or less delimit what to expect? Uh, mostly, I think that the, the main thing when, when having interactions in, in the community, we need to have the feeling that we have been like productive in terms of arriving to a, a point uh, and that the, the time was not wasted. So how, how do you think we, we can set the, the expectations in, in beforehand of the meeting on how to uh, what to expect from the meeting? Thank you. You're muted, Chris, sorry. I'm, I'm a bit uh, too enthusiastic with the muting. Uh, but anyway, uh, the the thing with this is, is that, you know, if it's a formal meeting, I would suggest, you know, add an agenda to the calendar invite uh, at least a, a certain amount of time before. If there's anything important to read, you know, all of this. Um, and so that is one way to go. Uh, I think in that sense, if you, for example, doing a brainstorm, the example you gave is also to have a one, a clear question around what is uh, the brainstorm about, but to also indeed um, provide some expectation management around, uh, okay, what is it that um, you will be doing? Uh, what is it that you should not be doing? You know, if, if I, I just led a brainstorm earlier today, so that's that's a perfect fit. And as I said, it's it's not about curating ideas just yet. It's literally just trying to dump as much um, uh, ideas as you can on there, and then also saying what will be done with it. And so I also said, you know, I will take the responsibility to then go through this and provide you with some um, some insights from that. But everything that that you produce will. Uh, be available to you to also uh, digest on your own. So in that sense, um, it's good to indicate what will be done with uh, with this session, uh, what is the purpose of it. Um, and so having purposeless uh, sessions is always very frustrating. It can, you know, you can have a very engaged group and they will lose motivation very quickly if they don't understand why it's happening and especially if they then don't see what happens with it. So you can do, um, you can leave out the sharing the purpose if it becomes very clear after, but you can uh, you you cannot really um, leave out both. So in that sense, it's very important to set the stage and to articulate what it is that might seem super obvious to you as the person organizing, because somebody might not have read the email, somebody might not have uh, thought about this meeting until they literally. You know, they have back-to-back -back, uh, sessions and then uh, they just came off the toilet because they they couldn't any other moment, so they're a few minutes late. So um, really taking people along on that journey is something that I can only encourage. I find it hard to articulate exactly, you know, these are good things, three things, and then you'll be good. It's uh, also a, um, a, a feeling you have to uh, develop by by noticing that people say, hey, I, I didn't get this. And then you go like, oh, of course I forgot. So um, I hope that's not too rambly and that helps you uh, some way. No, no, yes. Uh, thank you for, for the answering and super clear. Uh, more or less like always uh, accomplishing like a wrap up of ideas uh, after the the meeting and so as to maintain the, the engagement, let's say, not to uh, make people disengage from the ideas we have discussed. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. One, one slight addition for my end that I just realized is also to um, sometimes people overcompensate and communicate too much. Um, so also thinking about uh, um, taking up as little time as needed. So being very concise and effective in what you're trying to communicate. I see a hand from Ruth. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Great. Um, I just have a question. It's like pretty vague, but um, it's about community interactions with people who are like taking up too much space or how to navigate that in community interactions. Like I'm on a project where like a different project, actually, which there are like 15 or 16 people um, and it's an indigenous 
like literatures project and so a lot of like there are quite a few settler voices and they're like taking up a lot of space mm -hmm. but we don't necessarily have this clear cut like community guidelines how to contribute like these documents that we've been talking about which I'm very excited to like take back to the project manager and be like look at these cool things um but what do you do when things get out of hand and say you're like not in a position where like really you have very much power like it's very collaborative and like things have kind of gone to the like beyond collaborative and more like co-creating and then how do you rein it in when people are like taking up too much space or not acting within the guidelines and yeah what do you do so if it's on a zoom session what has been super oddly effect effective i didn't do it for quite a while um, it, it, it took me a very long time to discover but literally just using the raise hand feature is sometimes super helpful. People will shut up so quickly um, for some reason, uh, or they won't shut up at all. So that's a, a very concrete thing you can do. Um, but then also what I like to do is reframe the issue as in, am I being fr from am I being rude to interject now to thinking about, well, I'm probably not the only person who's a bit frustrated with this right now. So um, how is my behavior not, if, if I try to sort of, um, not stop the person, but to contain this. Um, how am I helping other people as well? And so that uh, helps me get over my nerves sometimes. And then uh, so that is one way to, to to at least facilitate my my own feelings to to actually do it. Um, and sometimes uh, uh, what really helps is to back channel with someone and checking in and saying, "Hey, uh, like you don't have to write a lot, but oh, they just keep." talking and then they go like yeah and then that can sometimes be just the the slight encouragement for you or for them to to interject because there's some social validation happening uh, so it's not just you um, but yeah it's hard and uh, sometimes it needs to be very directly addressed and um, and say okay well we, we have to move on or we need to go back on topic um, if we want to keep talking about this there's we have to create another space for that um, but yeah, that's not a vague question at all and happens a lot. Uh, your specific setting sounds uh, very relevant and it sounds like it, it could be very salient also to actually bring some of these points up. So I hope you find a way to deal with that situation. Thank you. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, sorry, just to clarify, like, do you think these kinds of documents, um, like community guidelines and... I guess what happens if you don't follow the community guidelines can be implemented afterwards. Um, and whether you've seen that done successfully, I used to be a teacher. And so I know that if you let the students run free for a week, it's really hard to rein them back in. And I think adults are more like kids than they, than they suspect. So, I mean, it's really been hard for us to rein things back in and our meetings are kind of always like hours longer than they should be. Um, so, I don't know, do you have any tips about implementing those afterwards? I, I would probably say don't implement them as uh, rules because then they feel like, oh, why are we changing things? But say, hey, we want to try something different today. Um, we'll do uh, this. And that will then change the dynamic for once. And so thinking about getting started in that direction where you want to go. To, to sort of shift the dynamic. And then sometimes people will be like, oh, that was so nice to have this different dynamic. And then they will want to stick with it and they might start maintaining that norm themselves. Um, and otherwise you can say, okay, well, we tried this last week. Uh, we want to keep doing this. Right, okay, thank you. Awesome. So does anybody has other questions? Um, from this discussion, I was just thinking here in the open seeds meetings, we have some kind of um, habit. So sometimes we try to prioritize questions from people who have not spoken yet. And we try to encourage people that are talking less or writing less in the chat. And also another thing that I find helpful is the time for self-reflection. Because when I'm in a meeting and I need to speak up, if I don't self-reflect before, my tendency is to not speak at all. So maybe that's helpful for Liv in her meetings. Um, try to give people some time to self-reflect and think about 
what they want to talk about before. Okay, if we don't have any other questions or comments, I will thank you, Chris, very, very much. That was super, super interesting and engaging. <laughs> well, thank you for uh, having me. I'll, I'll stick around for, for Kirsty's mountain of engagement. I'm very interested. We all will. <laughs> thank you. I will pass the torch to Ariel. Hi, folks. Um, thank you very much for joining us in the second part of the call. Uh, we're now moving on to uh, our second presentation, which is uh, Kirsty Whitaker on the mountain of engagement. Kirsty, the floor is yours. So it's almost like the Open Seeds team um, know that these two presentations fit really well together. So I'm delighted to to be following on from Chris's all of Chris's points, and I think you'll see how they start to fit into kind of a bit more of a um, a bit of structure, which also obviously is a lot of what you're talking about across the whole of the um, the program. So um, I just want to acknowledge that I. Um, looked through Chad Sciencing's um, slides from a previous cohort of Open Seeds, and basically they're excellent. So I'm using all of exactly these slides. He licensed them as CC BY, so I am not apologizing for using them. They are licensed for this exact purpose. I was able to do other really fantastic, positive, uh, impactful work uh, because I did not have to reinvent the wheel and I have used uh, Chad's slides. So these are Chad's slides. I'm delighted to be presenting them. Here's uh, me and more excitingly, here's a picture of me. It looks exactly the same as what I'm wearing now, which I didn't realize. <laughs> I didn't realize. Um, that's me from a few months ago. And my daughter, uh, her name is Mackenzie. We were up in the Lake District, uh, which is in the northeast of northwest, sorry, of England, um, where my mum lives. That so I think this was taken at Easter time. Um, I live in London at the moment, and um, I founded a project called the Turing Way, and it was uh, it all sort of stemmed from a fellowship that I had with Mozilla as an open science fellow, um, and I know an awful lot of the people that have been leading. Um, these pieces of work that you're learning from because we all sort of were trained and supported and mentored uh, as part of that now uh, no longer existing uh, Mozilla fellow, uh, Mozilla Open Science community. Um, I am technically a neuroscientist, as in I have a PhD in neuroscience and I did work and publish in neuroscience for a while, but I um, sort of now work more broadly across thinking about um, infrastructure and thinking about people as infrastructure. Um, I have not put my current affiliation on here because I actually just a week ago, well, like three days ago, <laughs> technically, left my job um, at the Alan Turing Institute. I led a really exceptional team of people uh, focusing on open source tools, practices and systems at the Alan Turing Institute. And I am on um, annual leave for a couple of months and then 2025 will open up new and exciting open source adventures. Um, so... Chad starts by asking, what is inclusive leadership? And essentially, iterating is sort of one of the most key parts of inclusive leadership. So you want to, if you're going to lead a, an open source project or an open science project, you're going to think about inviting people in to your project. You should have clear processes for how you onboard them. At some point, once they have been onboarded, once they've sort of gone through enough steps to feel that they've got their feet on the ground, you want to empower them. I would encourage you not to empower people too early. That's actually giving them too much space and it's really destabilizing. But at some point they will have their feet on the ground and you can give them tasks, small tasks, growing to slightly bigger ones. You should always be checking in on members with members of your community and reviewing to see whether things are going well or not. And you should spend time recognizing the people in the community. So celebrating their contributions, big, small, um, particularly the ones in the background, particularly the ones that are that are care work, that take, you know, the people who take notes, the people who um, 
follow up the visible contributions you know yes give them a little sort of thumbs up but really take the time as an inclusive leader to recognize the work that is going on in the background so to build on one of chris's points the the time it takes to write a short email is much much more than the time it takes to just ping out a whole bunch of unstructured text and so thinking about the expertise that's associated with that and recognizing and appreciating that is a really good little sort of small example of then going around this circle again so you will then um, reflect and renew your commitment to inclusive leadership you might invite the next people in you'll onboard them, you'll empower them, and you'll keep moving everyone around and adjusting the roles appropriately. Now, I've added in this slide because I think this is a sort of a huge uh, passion point of mine. I'm not sure that people know what leadership is. And what is great is that the project that I uh, founded and that a thousand people have contributed to now has a chapter on leadership, on inclusive leadership. So I encourage you to go check it out and see how it resonates with you. But my point for adding this slide in is you're here and you are leaders and you may not feel like a leader, but actually almost no one does feel like a leader on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so thinking about kind of both the fact that you are a leader and the fact that you are hoping to encourage others to be leaders is an important step in making sure that you provide that amount of engagement and you bring people in and you empower them. I've got this quote. I took it from the chapter um, on leadership that's in the Turing way. It's a quote from Brene Brown. A leader is anyone who takes responsibility for finding the potential in people and processes and has the courage to develop that potential. That's part of that iterative cycle. You're going to keep it going forwards. Leadership is not about titles or the corner office. It's about the willingness to step up, put yourself out there and lean into courage. And to be clear, there are power dynamics that are at play and they absolutely interact with leadership. But I encourage you to keep remembering that power is different to leadership and vision. So what's amount of engagement? Well, here's a very simple mountain um, that actually comes from uh, Abby Cabinet Mays, who now used to work at Mozilla and now works at GitHub. Um, a sustainable community needs new people to come in and also a path to keep them. And they don't, you don't have to keep them. You don't want to sort of over metricize this, but you, you will not sustain a community by only having people join as newcomers. So there has to be a way to welcome folks and then also turn their first contact into sustained participation. And if you are very successful, not even very successful, if you are even moderately successful, you will bring them into the leadership responsibilities as well. This slide is um, just breaking it down a little bit further. It's still the same points. You can still see that you've got first contact, sustained participation and leadership. But what Abby's doing in this slide and what Chad has pulled together is you've got to be able to discover the fact that there's a project. And actually, I've got to admit, that's, pro that's probably the hardest, <laughs> sort of the hardest step. It's not the hardest emotional step, but actually in terms of the amount of information that's available in the world, discovering the fact that your project exists is one of the hardest. Then they will have a first contact with the pro with the project. They'll start to participate. You want to think about how do you work with them to sustain their participation? How do you think about their networked participation? I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that in a second. And how do you move them into leadership? So if I animate this slide, you will now be able to see that a lot of the content that you are learning, a lot of the discussions that you're having through the Open Seeds program is thinking about um, how do you build a public GitHub repository? How do you market what you're doing? How is it clear? Do you make sure that you have an open source license so that people understand the purpose? Do you have a clear mission when people first come into contact? Do you have clear communication channels? And is the README inviting people to participate, not just read passively? A participation, you might want to think about a personal invitation. 
How do you be responsive? You want to have some of those contributing guidelines in your code of conduct to keep some of the sort of safety rails up for people to know where they stand as they start to participate. And if you can work in a GitHub repository, if that's appropriate for your project, then the public issues and the pull requests are a really powerful way of seeing, of allowing people to see how they can join in. As you start to move into sustained participation, that's when you want to start to recognize the work, keep people connected to the mission and match their skills and interests. You want to formalize some of that mentorship, think about individual people's professional development, build up some hackathons and socials potentially with other projects so that you're not just sort of a siloed um, uh, group yourselves. And then into leadership, you need some clear governance. You want to make sure you're thinking about an exchange of value so you're not extracting, but you're actually giving something that is synergizing. Um, and you will almost always need to have a personal invitation until you are so popular that people are knocking on your door and you need to run elections. You probably need some personal invitations to get there. I want to highlight and this is this is really exploding everything out. So these slides are really more for you to kind of reflect on going forwards. The mountain of engagement is an oversimplification. It talks about a journey in a linear form and essentially nothing in our world is linear. Um, it's a matrix. And so what you want to be doing is thinking about how do you engage with people around their, their stories, their interests, their values, the behaviors that they have, the behaviors that you'd like them to have, what types of contributions, diverse types of contributions. Are you providing them leadership opportunities? Which leadership opportunities do they want? Are you providing them learning opportunities? Which learning opportunities do they want? Same with professional development opportunities, user research opportunities. And are you thinking about how you can um, give a value exchange and support their participation in decision making? This slide is going to talk you through um, how you might kind of step through, look, observing your community, noting the value exchange of the behaviours that are happening, and honestly just go back out and talk to people and say, what is it that you need? What is it that you get from participating in this community and the project? And what do you wish that you could have? Because you may find that it's very easy to give that. You just didn't know that that was something that they would they would consider to be of value. The final thoughts are, remember to be driven by the value and your values. So what's the unique selling point of the work? Why are you, why are you here? Why, why not be part of another community or another project, for example? And remember your values and your ethics of care. Think about... Uh, how your interactions change as the community scales and at the different levels. So it's really great concept of returners and multipliers. So a returner is someone who may touch and then go away for a bit and then come back. And they can be extremely, extremely powerful if you sort of don't get so, if you don't get too upset that they've gone for a little bit because they can they can really sort of energize the community um, and build very powerful connections. And then multipliers are people who enable others, who really make other people um, sort of see their potential and, and um, participate. So they are, they're great people to kind of keep an eye on. Be open and transparent as possible and also be mindful of the data that you collect. So, so walk that fine line between being like having ethical uses of data, but also being as open and transparent to encourage participation. Share what you learn. Be as brave as you can be in sharing what doesn't work. That will actually be a really great foundation for building trust. And then, as in the very first slide, iterate. Hypothesize, give it a test. If it doesn't work, revise, release and keep going around. So my last slide, sorry, I went a bit over time. Uh, I have this really, really important message to you, which is that you are already leaders and your community members are already leaders. They are there because they want to participate in this. So don't overthink the concept of leadership, focus more on those exchanges, those interactions that Chris was talking about, and think think more sort of holistically about empowering people, but giving them a structure that allows them to um, keep their feet on solid ground and know, know where they're going and how they're going with the rest of the community.
So huge thanks again to Chad and you've got my contact details on there if you ever want to get in touch. Thank you so much, Kirsty. That was uh, really, really amazing. And yeah, again, a big shout out to Chad for doing the original set of slides. Thank you. Um, I don't see any hands up at the moment. Does anyone have any questions for Kirsty? Uh, can I ask a question, please? Yes, please go for it. Yeah. Thank you, Chrissy, for the presentation. It was great. Uh, <laughs> my name is Elham and I had some questions regarding your profession in neuroscience. Uh, I think that because the works that you have done, uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, so experimental. I think that you had the experience of leading people from neurodiverse groups. Uh, I want to know that how could you manage your how how could you uh, adapt your expectations because, for example, when you are working with people from uh, different minorities, you some of your some things are better than from the things you expect before, and some things are worse than you expect before. How could you manage your plans? How could you manage your expectations? And how could you? Um, manage the community motivation and engagement to reach to their defined goals and achievements? So I want to acknowledge that I do have some experience working with neurodivergent people, but it's not from my time working as a neuroscientist. I actually have uh, an opportunity to work particularly with autistic people um, on a citizen science project. So I just want to acknowledge that actually very few neuroscientists properly actually ask uh, neurodivergent people about what they what their needs are. Uh, so I do have that expertise, but not because of the fact that I sat and looked at brain imaging scans for days and days and months on end. Um, it sounds like it sounds really trite to say, but I think it is the right answer is to um, remember that everyone's different. It's not really about being neurodivergent. It's about the fact that everyone's going to be coming with their own different set of interests, motivations, background expertise, skills. Uh, autistic people will often um, really appreciate clarity. So, that, so you can often get to a point where kind of, uh, if you work with autistic people, there will often be a lot of a lot of questions that relate to, to clarity and, and being able to provide that clarity is really helpful. But I gotta say, that's true for literally everyone, right? That's true for everyone. Um, people who have ADHD, um, will sometimes struggle with kind of uh, time, this concept of time blindness. So they'll struggle to know exactly what they are able to achieve in a certain amount of time. And again, clarity is a really good answer to that because if you break down the tasks and instead of assuming that everyone's uniform, everyone's going to be doing exactly the same tasks and you can just sort of dole them out at the beginning like playing cards. If you create sort of a, you know, a, what I suppose in like a tech field would be like a backlog of tasks that need to be done. Note their dependencies. So you break the tasks down sort of as small as, not, it doesn't literally need to be as small as possible, but in a, a very much more sort of achievable kind of state, link them together and then allow people to pick the ones that meet their interests and allow them to work on kind of one thing at a time. And you may find that you're able to sort of play to people's strengths much more that way. Um, I think it's really important if you do take that, that you don't um, patronize anyone. So if there are small tasks, but they build up to being essential for the mission and the sustained sort of success of the project, you should make sure to be clear about why that task, even though it seems small, is actually really necessary for the success of the project. So circulating notes from a meeting, for example, synthesizing them. It's a hugely important task. People often don't think about it as one of the most important tasks, but it is. Um, and I think sort of allowing people to therefore work on something 
until it's done, just diversifies their participation a little bit more. And I do want to be really clear that that's inspired by my experiences working with people who are autistic and have ADHD, but actually the advice works sort of almost perfectly for everyone. Yeah, thank you for listening to your presentation and talking to you. It was so inspirational for me and for my project. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, any other questions or comments from folks? I do see uh, Laura in the chat has mentioned uh, that they're struggling to engage sustained participation and Graciel has agreed that that's probably the hardest part of an open project and Kirsty I don't know if you want to comment on the sustained participation in particular if you can share some of your experiences there. So I'm super happy to answer that which is it is definitely the hardest part and it's also, it's sort of logistically the hardest part. So if you think logically about it, a sustained engagement requires someone to have already gone through all the other steps. They have to really understand your project. They have to be totally bought in to them, not totally, but let's say they have to be like 85% bought into the mission. So even if you just think like playing a probability game, that person is hard to find, right? And so there will be a lot of people who don't make it all the way up to sustained participation. And I will share with you that I find that very, very difficult emotionally because I want everyone to care about everything the same level that I care about. And um, it is an important reflection to me that diversity in having people and what they care about and how they engage is in fact the success metric <laughs> metric so one thing is just to like logically recognize that it's really hard so it's not a failure it's a like you can lay out the path really well and there will be fewer people that can walk it just because the, the, the requirements are high the other thing to say is um you know the world is burning at the moment so uh it's we have literal climate change um, we have political destability. We have a genocide that's going on um, that's being sort of, you know, televised and and nothing's happening with it. And I think it's very, very important to recognize that if you are asking someone to come and do sustained participation on top of all their other responsibilities in this current context, that is also unbelievably hard. So to try to finish that on a slightly more motivating and positive note, difficult, um, the, the, the most useful thing to do is patience, is to extend your timeline for what does it mean to be sustained. So if your gut is that you want people to be, that sustained uh, engagement means they connect at every weekly meeting, for example, Maybe maybe pull that out to thinking, how could they sustain every month? Or maybe you've got monthly meetings, but maybe you want people to kind of touch base. Maybe, maybe you extend that to every quarter. Maybe you think about what is it that this person, that these people need as human beings to be able to participate? And that's quite different to what they need to understand the project. They may need time they may need space they may need forgiveness uh they may need for you to just listen to them talk about whatever it is that they find difficult uh whether it's related to the project or not and they almost certainly need um welcoming back when they're imperfect and i think that's that's helpful to recognize that that's true of all of us Great, thank you very much, Kirsty. I think we don't think we've quite got, we've got four minutes before we have to move on. I don't think we've got any other questions in the chat, but I know that Kirsty will be around uh, for the rest of the call if people want to uh, add more questions to the notes document or things like that. Um, so thank you very much, Kirsty. Uh, excellent presentation and yeah thank you for talking us through all of that and giving such a thoughtful answer to the final question um as well i think we 
quite a few people needed to to hear that today. Um, I'm going to unspotlight you, uh, and actually unspotlight myself. Ooh. Um, and we're going to move into um an actual uh practical uh discussion exercise um for everybody entitled value exchanges. Um, so Graciale is going to be making up uh, breakout rooms based on whether you have indicated that you would like to write, speak or speak um, and the different uh, languages that you have indicated. There is a summary of the uh, different symbols up at the top of the Framapad on line 25, but I'm going to post them again here. If you have not already renamed yourself, please rename yourself with a, a letter or a short code at the beginning of your name to make it easy uh, to assign you to a breakout room. Um, but we will be assigning you to breakout rooms um, and there will be a space for reflecting on the uh, presentations that we've heard uh, uh, recently from Kirsty and from Chris in particular. Um, I posted the questions in the chat, um, but we'd like you to reflect on what are you giving to your community, organization, or project? What is it giving back to the community? And if there are gaps, how might you close them uh, between uh, what you are giving, what the community is giving back, and uh, where you think you'd like to be in terms of that exchange? And then other prompts for discussion include, what kinds of things do you give to others in your open leadership practices? What kinds of things do you get back when you participate and, and sort of uh, you know, enact open leadership practices? And does the balance seem right to you or do you feel there are adjustments that you would like to make as well? Um, so these are sort of general reflection prompts, um, but if you have other topics or other things that have come up from the uh, presentations, please do include them. Um, there are also uh, spaces from line 176 in the shared notes document. Uh, I'm just going to reshare that here in case anyone has misplaced it uh, for your breakout room to also add their reflections in there um, as well. I'm going to look at Graciele and say, have you completed the breakout rooms? Are we ready to go? Wonderful. So you will have uh, approximately 15 minutes to uh, talk through in groups of three. And Graciele, please uh, open the breakout rooms and we'll head off to our discussions. Rooms are open. One coming. I think everyone's going to trickle back in from their breakout rooms. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope that session uh, was useful and you enjoy getting to know the other people on the call as well. Um, if you would like to add any extra reflections to uh, the notes section from line 177, please do. Um, but we're running slightly behind schedule. So in the interest of time, we're going to move straight into personas and pathways. And I'm delighted to present Victory Brown, who is going to um, give us this presentation. Victory, please take it away. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Victory Brown, and I'm a designer at Super Bloom. Well, a design researcher at Super Bloom. And outside of that, I do a lot of open source work where I do community management and program management. And I'm here to talk to you about how we can combine user research and um, user synthesis to build better communities and also to design better programs for communities. Uh, going to share my screen now and when you can see that let me know okay share are we, we good yeah awesome <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, I did introduce myself when I started. My name is Victor Brown and I'm a design researcher at Superbloom. And um, I used to be a contractor for them as a community builder for their coaching program. And then I got retained to do design research and also help them with community related projects. So I'm really excited to talk to you about this because it's something that I I love to do and it's just like a combination of all of my experience in my open source journey and in just like my tech journey as well uh if you are familiar with the open source space and when we talk about sustainability one of the things that we mentioned when we talk about sustainability is community building i mean there are a whole lot of methods to sustain programs and projects but recently community building has been at the top of everybody's list everybody wants to build a community but not everybody can build a sustainable community and not everybody can turn a community into users into commercial users and customers and even people who begin to pay for software so i think maybe i'm just going to scratch the surface of what we're going to talk about but i hope it's going to be helpful for whatever projects that you're building right now. The first thing that comes into your mind when you talk about community is why, why build a community? Why is it necessary to have a community? Um, are all projects supposed to have communities? Because I've seen people who have in, who have built interest in community go into community building and also like fail and the project is, is not working. So um, why is community important? I think it's important to note that every community and every project has an audience that they are building for. For us, we call them users. For more, some, some people, they call them contributors, co customers, consumers. Whatever your project is, you have a target audience that you are building for, people that would use that project. And it is important that you know why you need to build a community for those people, right? Everything, every time when people gather and it's just like two folks talking about the same interest, same goal, some community is formed. But for us to build like sustainability and use what we know about community to like um, build more sustainable tools and design more programs that are inclusive, we need to know why we are doing these things. So um, like any other projects, to comment, you need to conduct user research. This is where you begin to understand your users, your customers, the people who will become community members and eventually become contributors to your project. How do you go about conducting um, community-based user research? Um, I think the speakers before me did a good job talking about how you need to set objectives, you need to set goals of your community and those goals help you to, you know, de design, not just onboarding, but like the structure of how your community would be over time, kind of like a roadmap, right? So why um, setting objectives for your community is the answer to why community. If you are a founder or you're building your project and the thought of having a community has been lingering on your mind, I think the first thing to do is grab a sheet of paper and write down what you think a goal would be an objective for you to have this kind of community be have an active community that's probably built on slack built virtually somewhere or like have physical meetups right so you set the objective set your goals the next thing is you identify your current user base a lot of times when projects want to start thinking about community they forfeit um the present users and they begin to look for new customers outside they begin to do more marketing but the thing is that sometimes the folks who are already users of your product are the folks that would now become kind of advocates and talk to other folks about your product or your tool or your software or even your community. Just say you want to build an NGO, for instance, people who you have created a safe space for who feel the need to talk to others who find who have similar problems or challenges with them and they join your community and it goes on from there. The thing, like I said, you identify your current user base. Who are the people that are in my network? Who are the people who are currently using what I'm building? Who are the contributors that we have? How many active contributors are there? What, what is the reason they are still here? What are they currently benefiting from? And to do this, you send out things like surveys. So this is where the user research comes in. You send out um, surveys to your current community um, asking them questions on how they are currently feeling about the community. Questions like this will provide you with insight into what you currently have. And that insight will direct the next phase of your research, which is extending to other users. And this you can do by hosting like community hackathons, but that's something we'll talk about later. So um, I think in this slide, I've been able to put all these things together because at the end of the day, when you do this research, you are able to form personas, which is what we are currently talking about. Like these personas are um, 
I'll talk about them in future slides. But yeah, personas will help you to design user journeys, user flow for your community. And when I say user journeys, user flow, it means what is the progression from someone who is a novice or an intermediate person, or a middle level developer joining your community and what is the progression that they can. Have you outlined and designed a pathway for them to you know, grow in your community to being probably board members, advisory leaders, or even like taking up more active roles in your community? What the personas represent, we've talked about community and why it is important. And now this community is what is fueling personas because personas are people, right? When we do research, they might not necessarily carry all the names of the people we do research for, but they carry their characteristics, which is important. Those characteristics is what makes it important for us to build these tools or build a, a safe community or design programs that are helpful and converting depending on what kind of need your project has. So like I said, personas are fictional representations of target users, but they capture the real goals, needs, and experiences and behaviors of real life users in your community or in the extended community. So when you do your user research and you send out surveys and you ask people questions about how they currently perceive your tool, perceive the community, they give you feedback. That feedback that they give to you is what you use to develop personas. And that persona is what gives you insight to designing more you know, inclusive experiences, seamless user experiences or community programs for them. So like I said, with personas, we have provided insights into user groups and they also like create a clear pathway for you. Personas are also very useful tool in communicating to stakeholders. And when I say stakeholders, I don't just mean funders of projects, but also people who are building these tools with you because personas give your team an understanding and also like helps them be more empathetic towards the people that they are building for. So the goal is that we're trying to draw empathy so that we are more considerate of these user needs and then we can design tools that not only benefit us as product owners or like people who want to go into the market and make money, but as people who are empathetic and are user-centered in their dealings, right? So um, what should a persona have and why is it useful? Personas are useful because they provide you like insights into user demographics, right? And they should con contain user demographics. Uh, I'll probably link an article that I wrote it's about like three years since I wrote the article. So excuse whatever grammatical errors there are. I'll probably update it later on. But yeah, personas should also be backed up by proper research. You do not assume who your persona is. You do not assume the details of your persona. Persona characteristics are gotten from in-depth research. Um, understanding users, communicating with them, taking note of their behaviors. Um, sometimes users see different things and they do different things. Taking note of all of those things help you to draft good personas. And I'm saying personas, but in some projects they are called archetypes, they are called um, characters. It depends on your project and how much you want to use your persona to communicate. Uh, this is an example of a persona. This persona can work for any project. Um, it has, Let's say we're building an educational tool, or building a, yes, an educational tool that we want to create a community or a forum ar around, right? We've sent out surveys and we've had a bunch of data come in to our like um, database and we are creating a persona. This is just one of the personas of the many applicants that we've had. So you can see Alex is a developer, he's 24. He has things that he motivates him. He has goals of wanting, why he needs to be part of our project or why he wants to be, in the open source space or why he wants to build tools. He has goals and these goals and these challenges are what we understand as community builders, as user researchers, as designers that we analyze and then we begin to design pathways. We begin to design better onboarding, more inclusive programs, more accessible programs, do events in more accessible ways. This is what gives us that insight. Um, I think I've talked about this, but I'll just brush about uh, how pathways are like journeys that you community members go through when engaging with your project. So this can be from when they meet you on social media and um, they get to your documentation, find you on GitHub, try to join Slack, etc. cetera. Um, that's what pathways are. And there are steps to creating a seamless pathway, which is also the same with 
they use our research, they work hand in hand, personas, they use our research provided with personas, personas provided with insights to de design better pathways for your community. So we have discovery, we have onboarding, we have sustained participation and leadership. The goal of all of these things is to make sure that you understand your user needs, your community member needs, and you design better programs for them. Um, this is a slide. This is very in-depth, so I would not, I know that, I don't know how many minutes I have left, but this is more in-depth, and when I share the slide, you can go through it. It's about, like, the types of community members that you would find in your community. Let's say they are archetypes. We have, we are building communities, and we are members of communities, and we know one or many of these people. We have the contributors, people who are active. We have creators who are not just active in community, but they make resources for other people to use. We have people who just, like, lay back in the community. They're just there. They're just receive but they don't speak they don't attend meetings or maybe they might attend meetings but they don't do anything other than that they're just dormant so this table just shows you how to engage them how you can ad identify them you use the user research to identify them and then you use these engagement strategies to design better pathways for each of them um yes so that's the end of my slide um if there is any slide if i have time and there's anyone that you need me to go in depth or like be clear about please let me know but yeah thank you for this opportunity it was good thank you so much victory um uh what we're gonna do is we do have a couple of a couple of minutes for questions we are going to skip the silent reflections exercise and ask you to do that after the call in the shared notes document um but i can see azam has a hand up already please uh, ask your question Thank you for the presentation. It was, um, you know, it uh, triggered a lot of thoughts in my mind, but it still it is kind of vague for me. You know, this is the first time I heard about persona. And uh, when I talk about the community, it means that the, uh, so necessary it's going to be an online community because I'm going to engage them. So it means that probably I should have an account on one of the social medias or an, on my website. So would you please elaborate on these two? parts personal and how I'm going to build where I'm going to build the community and engage. Okay. It. So um this boils down. Thank you for that question. So um initially when I started I said you do user research. The idea of user research is when you decide that you want to build communities, there's one question that should be in your mind, which is why? Why do I need a community? And if and when you answer that, so if you say why do I need a community, you're building a tool, you need users, and you need the users to be together because you probably want to do some user testing with them. You have plans of them networking and connecting with each other, right? This is the why. The why now tells you you now have an understanding of why you need a community. The next thing that you do is who should be a member of this community? Who is this thing, this community I'm building for? Who does it benefit? Who are the people who would find this community useful? For instance, um, early this year, Super Bloom built a project for, we built a community of practice for a health organization, right? Now they had come to a point where they realized that we don't only need all of our experts to be scattered all over the place. We want to build a hub where all of these experts in epidemiology and other like um, pandemic and epidemic uh, issues or crisis come together. So they decided it was not going to, uh, building a chapter would have not worked, building a working group would have not worked. What will work is an autonomous body that has sole ownership and control over the resources that these people create. So now because a this organization is a big corporation, they understand that they are not just building. Why they need to build this is because they need these people to interact together, contribute and network. And that's what a community of practice does. It does that better than a working group. So when you have your understanding on why you need a community, you now begin to like um, identify who is going to be a part of this community and where do you find these people. Community members are scattered about in so many places online. Some people are actively lurking online. Some people are dormant in other communities communities it's it doesn't hurt for you to you know spread out your surveys when we do surveys at sustain oss which is another community that i'm a part of we send out our surveys on all social medias that we are part of the thing about the survey is that you need to put down questions <laughs> sorry i have so much um, no, that, so, that's something yeah but but i think it needs a lot of time at the same time for example a mm -hmm. team it should cannot one person so for example a research team should have one person responsible for uh you know, uh, you know posting the uh, uh, contents, so engaged people, and the other team should be responsible for 
So what happens when most times you are the sole um, leader, you alone are just like building your tool, but you need hands because that's what happens a lot in open source. We see someone who has an idea and they begin to be write code for the product, but then um, it's a lot for one person. So what they do is they be a part of something. They either be a part of Hacktoberfest and have more open issues so that new contributors can contribute. And in that way, they have more people interacting with GitHub. And from there, who knows, they begin to decide, okay, we want to have all of these contributors who are dropping issues in um, in issues in GitHub. We want to have them somewhere. We want to have them maybe on Slack or in Discord because we want to have them together. Now they have built, helped us to build this tool. We want to have people who would also be a part of the testing phase. So it's better to not lose these contributors, let's have them somewhere. So as a product owner, what I'll do is I'll send out surveys still on GitHub on software and I'll ask, what platform would you, if you want to join a community, what platforms are most easily accessible to you? So people begin to give their feedback like Slack, Discord, Telegram, and I decide, okay, more people are comfortable using this tool. Let's start building a community here on Telegram. And on Telegram, the community now begins to, you know, um, organically grow because we have more issues. More people are using our tool. They are giving feedback. We're sending them not just to GitHub, but we're sending them to our Telegram channel. So from there, your community moves from being 10 people to 15 people to 50 people. And then you decide that, I want to know if these people who are in my community are benefiting as much as I think that they are. So what you do is you send another set of surveys out. It's an iterate and design process. Like you find out the issues, you fix, you check if it's working, you continue to iterate like that. Community is not built in a day. It's something that is progressive. And also if you want your community to grow organically, you need to set structures, not just um, growth structures, but engagement strategies, because those things help. I know that the former speakers had already like dropped light on this, but yeah, I hope this answered even just a little of your question, but I'm always open to, you know, answer a question. <laughs> so something. We have, we have access to your emails yet. If you have further questions yes. or on a slide. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're Great. Welcome. Thanks very much, Victory. I think that's all we have time for today because we are five minutes over time. So I'm just going to hand over to Taj to close the call. <clears throat> thank you, everyone. Um, sorry, my voice is not very clear today, but um, thank you very much to our speakers. The conversation has been really interesting for everyone. And I think um, it has created some thoughts in the um for different projects, which is part of the aim of um this um um presentations i would like us to stop so that we don't take much more of your time but i'm happy to stay on the call if there are a few questions that we could answer before um we end the call finally and um, thank you <laughs>